and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and you've got a terrific singing voice. You're like the Michael Buble of karaoke rooms. I am very, very intimidated to sing next to you, but I just enjoy it too much. And the program you're listening to is brought to you by Meat Bullets, the quickest, deadliest way to deliver meat in a straight line, period. Let me ask you something. What if you want to inject delicious meat-flavored protein into a moving target, but you're a vegetarian? Well, good news. The folks over at Delicious Munitions now make a vegetarian meat bullet, armor-piercing soy. Now, I know what you're thinking. Soy? Ugh, no thank you. Hey, now, don't be so quick to judge. Vegetarian ammunition has come a long way since the cardboard-tasting dreck somebody shot James Garfield with. In all honesty, you may not even be able to tell if you're eating teriyaki bullets or soy bullets. They're that good. So soy bullets are an ideal product for, say, vegetarian hunters. You can't very well go into the woods and shoot up an elk with a 19 millimeter parabellum chipotle if you're vegetarian. That's unethical. But soy bullets are an entirely different story. They are vegan friendly products from start to shipping. Blast away, guilt free. Now at this point you might ask, would it be somewhat inappropriate to slay an elk with soy bullets? Maybe. I'm not a philosophy professor, but I have to think it's probably fine. If not, well, okay, I guess you could just go hunting and kind of shoot around the elk's feet to make it dance for your entertainment like like the, the drunk in an old western. That way nobody gets hurt, but you still get to go hunting. What do you want from me? I'm just trying to sell high-velocity protein here, doing the best I can. So try out the sumptuous new armor-piercing soy from Delicious Munitions. Ready, aim, snack. Game of Thrones started up again this week. I was so excited to watch that on Sunday when it came out. I love that series, and so uh, we're going to do a, a sketch on that. If you're not familiar with it, um, uh, then uh, you should uh, pause this program and then watch all seven consecutive seasons of Game of Thrones. That way, I'm not blowing it for you uh, if you are familiar with it. I think you'll like it. This is Game of Thrones as reviewed by a caterer in Game of Thrones by me, Andrew Heaton. I cannot tell you how much I hate my job. I would like to cater one event, just one event, where none of the guests die. In fact, at this point, I would settle for catering an event where the guests die, but don't die horribly. For example, I was supposed to have a day off, but my friend Tim was hungover. So he asked me to cater a wedding between Edmund Tully and Rosalind Frey, with a bunch of Starks from up north attending. Okay, I thought. I was kind of looking forward to sleeping in, but sure. I make some extra money on the side, and it was good money. But not good enough, in my opinion. First, Walter Frey was not particularly nice to any of us staff. I wore my standard white shirt, my black necktie, and he flew into an almighty rage, maybe change into a buckskin apron. Okay, fine. You're coordinating the serving staff, I get it. But you should have made that clear when you hired me, not when I show up. Second, we didn't have nearly enough eggs. I had to go into town to get more eggs. And while they did reimburse me, they took their sweet time. Not exactly rolling in money, and that did put some stress on me and my roommate, who covered my rent. I plan to pay him back once I'm a famous actor, but still, I need that money here and now. Finally, the phrase viciously slaughtered all the stocks at the wedding, and that was definitely not a part of the description. Nobody said, okay, Toby, there's going to be a lot of blood. Maybe you should wear boots. What with all the knee-deep human guts you're going to have to wade through to pick up plates and whatnot after all is said and done. Oh, and don't expect any of the stocks to tip you because there'll be a steaming pile of corpses on the floor, bleeding everywhere, staring at you with unblinking, murdered eyeballs you'll see every night for the rest of your life as you're trying to go to sleep. You would think that would be a one-time thing, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think that's a once-in-a-lifetime thing? No. No, not hardly. Because a couple of months later, I catered King Joffrey's coronation, and that was also just horrible. First, we had to be there at 6 a.m. We couldn't actually do anything until 9 o'clock when the food got there. So why'd we have to be there so early? Hurry up and wait, that's what that was. But I guess the main thing is when I was pouring someone's wine... I saw King Joffrey die terribly, turning purple with his weeping mother over him. Well, that was unsettling. And then afterwards, when I walked around offering everyone deviled eggs, people got mad at me. Didn't want to eat. Well, okay, fine. King is dead. 
Everyone's in a foul mood. All right. Should I go home then? No. Well, guess I'm going to keep serving devil eggs. What would that being my job? Finally, last month, I went back to Walter Frey's castle to cater his family reunion. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Family reunion? Not a lot of horrible bloodshed at a family reunion. But then I start serving wine and whatnot, and old Walter Frey gets up and addresses his cousins and so forth, and they all start vomiting up blood and dying everywhere. Well, how's that supposed to make me feel? I bloody well served it to him. I served those people poison. I didn't know I was killing them, but still I was. That's kind of a nasty memory I have to shake off, particularly given that I have PTSD now and my acting career is stalled. The only good thing about that whole awful experience was a nice young girl who gave me meat to make meat pies with. Here you go, she said. Here's a big chunk of meat to make meat pies with. Delicious, fresh meat pies. Be sure to make them nice, then give them to Wall de Frey. She tipped me she did. Nice young lady. Anyway, thinking about getting out of the catering business into something else, like bartending. My guest today is Arthur Brooks. He is the author of Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. And he is the star of the film The Pursuit, which also came out. So we've got two things to discuss today. Yeah, at, we, at least we have more than that. We, and we've been, we've been hanging out for the last 35 minutes. We've yeah. covered uh, Buddhism, Stoicism, romance. Uh, we, we, we had a, a wild gambit. I'm sorry Absolutely. that we, I, sh I should have recorded this without you knowing. And then, and then had it as like an extra feature we could have sold. Well, let's do it again. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So um, let's let's start with the film, uh, The Pursuit. Tell me what that's about. I, 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 you are a pro-market person. Yeah, I am a pro-markets guy. I'm the president of the American Enterprise Institute, a big think tank. It's been around for 81 years in Washington, D.C., based on free enterprise and American leadership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the reason I came into that movement is not because I'm ideologically aligned. I mean, I'm a, I'm a French horn player as a, for a living. I was a, an artist my whole life until I, you know, had this weird experience and, and went, went to college when I was 30. And, and, you know, I had this sort of midlife change intellectually. And, and what I found was that I was most interested in the alleviation of poverty. And the thing that has alleviated poverty better than anything else in the history of humanity is the American free enterprise system. And I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. Now, I run this think tank and I have these I write books and the whole thing. But I thought, you know, this is not getting it to millions of people. So somebody said, why don't you make a movie? And I said, uh, I don't know how to make movies. I, I'm a French horn player who became an economist. I have no idea. I, like, I, I know what I don't know. And so we went into the market to look at the the most interesting creative filmmakers. And, and I asked each one of them that I was thinking of working with, I said, answer one question. Why do all think tank movies, especially by conservatives, why do they all suck? <laughs> <laughs> Why do they, just tell me that. Why do they suck? And, you know, I got a wide range of you know, <clears throat> throat clearing and, you know, answers, sort of non-answers until this guy from Austin who runs Emergent Order, which John is this, Popola. John Popola. He's a super creative guy. He said, because they're making propaganda and propaganda sucks. He says, the problem is they need to make a beautiful movie that actually moves people's hearts and tells stories. And if it convinces them of something so much, the better. And I said, that's it. That's it. Finally. And we've been working together. And what he did was he just followed me around the world for three years in my ordinary interactions. And the Himalayas with the Dalai Lama. That's your ordinary interaction is going to the Himalayas to hang out with the Dalai I Lama? I got the best life. Yeah. I got the best <laughs> life, Andrew. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. And, you know, tromping around a slum in, in, in you know, outside of Mumbai. You know, at a homeless shelter in New York, because, you know, part of my job as president of AEI is not just processing contribution payments. It's what the what Pope Francis calls the, the shepherd smelling like the sheep. You got to go where your policies are in action so you can see whether or not they work. So I'm, I'm you know, out there all the time. And John Popola was with me with the film crew for three years. And he, he stocked this fully, you know, formed kitchen. And then he decided what to make for dinner. And and the result is this starts off, you know, kind of kind of conventionally. I'm a think tank president. I'm going to talk about, you know, why I like capitalism. And it gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And at the end, you know, I'm playing the French horn and I'm talking about love and I'm in the Himalayas with monkeys and talking to the Dalai Lama. And it just, it's a, it, he did a brilliant job. That, that's my problem with most, most conservative films is lack of of monkeys, lack of French horns. <laughs> That's if you, right. If you have better we horns than monkeys, that problem. Yeah. Right. you've we, got we. the deficit covered. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did that too. Like I, um, I, I, I think that the the boundaries of the Republican Democratic Party are, are kind of shifting and changing. And there's this sort of traditional idea of the Republicans and Democrats. And I, I look at what's happening right now and go, uh, at least in the Democratic Party, I see 
a kind of division between people that think markets are good but should be regulated and markets are evil. And I, I'm concerned about the latter. I, I, can, I can have a good conversation with somebody that thinks, yeah, markets are good, capitalism is great, but we do need to rein in bankers or whatever. All right, I probably am lower on the regulatory side than they are, but this, this kind of nascent thing that, that uh, capitalism is inherently exploitative and markets are bad, I, I am deeply concerned about that rearing its head. Yeah, no, I, here's where, why I'm happy about that. I mean, I, I am more hopeful and more optimistic than ever. And the reason is because we're having this big conversation and we wouldn't be having this conversation if this weren't rearing its head. Look, you know, when we talk about American democratic socialism, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, these are not Stalin. These are not people that want to bring a jackbooted thug and a knock in the night. The outrage industrial complex yeah. in American media that's saying they're about to come and take your guns. They're about to come, you know, they're about to cart off your children and put them in like some sort of big kibbutz. No, that's wrong. That's a lie. And they're lying to you to, to fire you up. But but they do have ideas that I think are, are really wrong, wrong for poor people. And what I care about is alleviating poverty and lifting mm. people up to equal dignity. So, so when they when they say, "Look, I think capitalism is, sh is a sham. I think socialism is a better solution," then I get to make a movie called The Pursuit, and I get to make a movie about ideas and about love and about people, and it's so exciting. And you know, I want the opportunity to share what's right and good, so I can serve my fellow man. And when nobody's talking about these ideas, I don't get that opportunity. Andrew Heaton and Arthur Brooks don't get to talk about that unless That's... unless they're bringing it up. Thank you, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Exactly right. Thank you, and I'm, I, I think that. It's a, I think it's great that she's saying what she thinks, and I think it's great that we get to live in a country where we can debate it. I agree, and I'll say that that I that lends itself to your book, I Love Your Enemies, which I loved. I loved this book, and it like it is. Uh, I mentioned this prior to the, the broadcast. So the, the reason that I'm doing this program, um, the the under like I've I, it's funny and it's thoughtful, and there's all these things I'm trying to do. But if if I were going to put a phrase on a mug, it's good and intelligent people can disagree on matters of substance. I make it uh, I make it a point to try and bring right. on. Uh, progressive friends, conservative friends, libertarian and other right. friends get along with them. Uh, and and I think people need to be doing it because yeah. I, I when you say that the, the the anger industrial complex, like I, I that there's you can make serious bank by trying to get people to hate their neighbors yep. and be afraid of their neighbors. And I think it's it's atrocious. And so I was thrilled that you wrote this book. Mm. And, and I'm I'm really honored to have you on the podcast because you're you're like the Yoda of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I'm not that old man. <laughs> <laughs> you're, okay. you're you're okay, you're the Obi-Wan Kenobi. Years you're, old. you're Obi Wan Kenobi circa episode two. Is that okay? <laughs> That's okay. All right, I can, cool. I can dig it. Man. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Um so but I was thrilled with that. I, I read the book. I, I uh, and I, I agreed with all of it. Um one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because you you make a very clear distinction between contempt and anger, right. which I thought was fascinating. And I right. hadn't really thought of things that way until I encountered your ideas. Can you elaborate on those? For sure. And and to begin with one thing that you said just a minute ago is that that reasonable people can disagree and it's actually the truth that reasonable people must disagree agreement is monopoly and monopoly brings stagnation and mediocrity this is a country and a society where excellence is based on the competition of ideas just as excellence in sports comes from competition and democracy comes from contested elections and and in markets actually leads to all this prosperity we must disagree the problem is that we're not disagreeing well and that's effectively shutting down the competition of mm -hmm. ideas what's doing that it's not because we're all angry with each other I mean, People say there's too much anger. That's wrong. Anger is no problem. It's a hot emotion. It says, Andrew, I want you to think what I think. I care about what Andrew thinks. Now, now you can be out of control, you know, sort of red faced. Right. And, if you're you flipping know, over like, desks and yeah, things, yeah, that's like, not going to help. Fle spittle flecked, you know, the whole, you know, crazy. Yeah, you just described my regular Tuesday. That is, you're right. I need to calm down. <laughs> the problem is when you take anger and you mix it in with disgust, which is a different mm -hmm. cognition, it's a different emotion. And that makes a toxic compound, kind of like ammonia mixed with bleach becomes chlorine gas. Don't do that. You'll die. And, and if you want to kill a relationship, the best way is to take your anger and mix in disgust, which goes from saying, I care about what you think to saying you are not worth caring about. You're, that's you're contempt. beneath. Yeah, exactly right. And that's contempt, the conviction or the expression of the worthlessness of another person. Now, the truth is we don't actually hold most other Americans in contempt, but we act as if we do because the outrage industrial complex, the bullies, the people who are terrorizing us and getting rich and powerful and famous, they're the ones who say that we should treat each other with contempt. Well, that's like basically Basically telling you to, you know, that, that telling me that I should treat my wife with contempt. That's the literally. I mean, I've got a guy that who's been on my podcast and who's in the book named John Gottman, the world's leading expert in marital reconciliation. He says that when people treat in a marriage treat each other with contempt, eye rolling, sarcasm, derision, dismissal, that is the the leading indicator that they will get divorced, even if they still love each other. That's what's wrecking our country. Yeah. So if we want to, number one, if we want to be persuasive. 
we must not express contempt because nothing, nobody's ever been insulted into agreement. This is yeah. a point that you've made, mm-hmm. and you've made it really eloquently. You can't insult people and they say you're a moron. Then yeah, expect if, them if, to go. You know, you're making a if, good if, point. Yeah, I, I want you to agree with me on the minimum wage, but also acknowledge that you're a complete mouth breathing idiot. Yeah, like, that's yeah, right. Yeah, it's and hard it's, to hard to do that. Isn't now it? that you mention yeah, it, you're you know, right. I am like, a moron. I, like, I should I'm, read more. I'm such a moron. Yeah. So so you can't and you're, you'll never insult anybody into agreement. So being contemptuous makes you unpersuasive. It's a self defeating thing unless you just want to virtue signal to your 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 four buddies on your own side or you want to get elected by you know a primary electorate or you know all this outrage industrial complex nonsense but if you want to be persuasive don't do that if you want to be happier don't do that i have a lot of data in this book and in, in, in love your enemies that shows that when you treat other people with contempt your stress rises your loneliness rises your depression rises your anxiety rises yeah. you hurt yourself and 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 if you don't like that the country is driven apart because 93% of Americans hate how divided we become, do your part. And so it's a win-win-win. Take contempt. You're treated with contempt no matter what. Look, I mean, people are going to be listening to this and they're going to post, you know, some uh, uh, saying Arthur Brooks is a moron and, and Andrew Heaton's a moron too, right? That's contempt. Yeah, I need, I need to go. I, I need to, to better navigate my Reddit page. They're, they're really running roughshod. <laughs> I need to, guys, be nicer on that one, yeah. <laughs> if you actually answer the contempt of the world with love, with warm heartedness, you will change your own heart. You'll be happier. You'll be a little bit more persuasive, especially to people who witness the interaction. Forget to the person you're talking to. You might change somebody else's heart and you might bring the country together. I, uh, I, I have been, um, it, it's been interesting doing this because I've been doing the podcast since November. And um, do you like it? Yeah, I like doing it. I, it's I, a daily podcast. It's, it's a, daily a lot podcast. of work. I like doing it. It is, yeah. And I and I got to say, like, for if you, if you're not familiar with comedy writing, writing one or two comedy sketches per day is a, a pretty taxing amount. That said, though, I'm getting paid to do comedy, which is mind blowing. Anybody that's getting paid to write comedy, that's I am the equivalent of a minor league baseball player in the humorist world. It's fantastic. Yeah, but it's hard because be funny now yeah. is a pretty tough directive. It, and it's and I'm still trying to figure out how to do that because we'll we'll be funny at the top of the show and then we might have a serious thing. The only thing I don't like about it is not this job it's the field politics is yeah. so divisive uh, right. i am not a combative person i am not a i know people like that that like they like jumping down in the gutter and taking a swing and they find it energizing i don't i really and uh, that's why i'm doing this is to to try and, and mend things but at the same time though um i am aware that i can never exit the political arena in a way that many of my friends can right. that aren't necessarily they might have the same viewpoints as me but they can kind of take a step back i can't do that because if i'm out getting coffee with someone and they're like what do you do oh i host a podcast well now once we get into it um that i, I would i would love for it to have a pause button uh on my social life regarding politics but that said though i'm i'm pleased to do it yeah, it's, no, a fun it's, a, job. it's a real privilege to be able to talk about ideas yeah. and have an audience for people and, and i was going right. to say the, the audience is one of the things that, that i've kind of learned from this um because the i've got a fairly wide swath of people that listen to this ideologically. It's, it covers a pretty good spectrum. I think that the median is probably somewhere between um, libertarians and, and thoughtful conservatives. But that said, the kind of the 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 operating umbrella term is political orphans. I think people yeah, are coming and most here. Most people who fit. are listening to you are in their twenties and thirties. So they're people your your age and younger, mm. which is weird. You're thirty five, right? I'm thirty five. How does it feel to be actually the, on the on the old end of your audience? Uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Uh, but hold now on, I mentioned but, you're my age. What, what I <laughs> what, what I wanted to say though is I do get a lot of emails that say I disagree with you, but I like the program, or I disagree yeah. with your guest, but I like him. And what what I found is that the people that listen to this, they're fine with me coming in and arguing against whatever their, their prevalent view is. They're fine with me bringing on guests that do it. The only time it becomes problematic is one if I miss up if I mess up a sci-fi reference. That irritates people. <laughs> uh, and I'm fine. I'm glad that they call me out on that. But more importantly, it's just contempt. If yeah. I if I bring somebody on that is very, very progressive or, or yeah. very, very conservative or whatever, if we have a good conversation and they they go in assuming that my audience is intelligent and has yeah. good intentions, everybody's cool. Right. If somebody comes in and is like, you know, you bigots that voted for Trump or whoever it is that might be a part of some subset of the group, they react poorly, That's which right. shouldn't be surprising. We don't like contempt. The problem yeah. is that we'll put up with it because it's coming from our bullies. Bullies almost always end badly in American politics. And it, it comes up a couple of times a century because you get after, particularly after in the 10 years after a financial crisis, where most of the, the rewards go to the top 20% of the income distribution, you get populists. Populists are inherently bullying people on both the right and the left. Yeah. And, and the truth 
truth is that they're, they're also known in, in psychological parlance as coercive leaders. People don't like coercive leaders, but they'll use them. And so what the populace in American politics today, on both the right and left, they don't understand, is they're being used. They're actually, and they will be thrown away. It will fragment and it'll fragment ugly because people, they want what you've got to offer. That doesn't mean that if you, if Andrew Heaton for president would be, you know, a, a catch on fire campaign right now. Although, you know, if you want to announce right now. Sweater vest revolution. <laughs> it's a sci-fi reference. Yeah, sci- sci-fi rever- fr- Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be. I think I'm gonna hold out on this one. Uh, yeah, crowded yeah. field. But think about it. But you know, so, but the populists who will will get the moment. They're the ultimate sort of followers. In in so far as there's a parade going down the street, so I got to jump in front of it. In, in democratic capitalism, generally speaking, leaders are, are followers because they're 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 reacting to a demand curve. You know, there's some demand out there for something for a product or for a political movement, but populists even more so. So people are unhappy with the contempt that's actually being spewed by their leaders. They, they, they dislike it and they will discard it. And that means there's a new moment for us. So this ideology that we're talking about in the Pursuit movie and in Love Your Enemies, the book, I mean, I, I think that this is actually the, the new wave and what we're coming into. I think there's... And it's oh, I just, might be on the vanguard? That makes me feel great because I, I feel like I'm fighting an uphill battle fighting tribalism because the, 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 the get rich scheme in media is to yeah. pick a team to hate. No, I know. And it doesn't and mean, do it. And, and again, you can have, if you, if you lock down a small percentage of the population, you can get really, really rich. That doesn't mean that that's the movement that actually absorbs people's attention. So, so who knows? Maybe, you know, you'll get a, a huge audience for your podcast talking about love and reconciliation over the next 10 years, or maybe you won't. But the point is you are the mainstream. You mm-hmm. are what most people want. Now, you can take a 3% chunk of the population. If 3% of America were listening to your podcast every day, you'd be, paying, you'd be getting $21 million a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are cases of that kind of thing happening, but that doesn't make it the right thing to do, nor yeah. what people want the most, nor giving you the greatest satisfaction. So, uh, assuming that, I th- I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that the audience is very much on board with what we're trying to do mm-hmm. and, the, and the purpose of your book. So, um, the, the case has already been made that contempt is bad, right. love is good, reconciliation is good, everybody's on board. What are some of the practical things we can do in our lives? Like w- one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I agree with you on contempt, but there's just one or two people in the yeah, public sphere that drive me nuts. And I, for the most part, like I try not to make the show about Trump, partly right. because everybody else is. And I just, I'm bored with that topic. But right. every once in a while, I'll jump on Twitter and, um, you know, you jab d- do a poke. Yeah. You, how do you poke? What do you do when you poke? Are oh, you I'll, poking because, at people who are trashing Trump or are you poking people who are, who are defending Trump? Oh, well, I, I generally poke at Trump. I, I'll, I'll do one of two things. Now, yeah. I, I might I might get on and say like some sort of, you know, um, uh, statement of, of morality or something. I don't usually do that on Twitter. I tend to do jokes, but like uh, I, I might just go, come on and make fun of him and say like, um, you know, the, the this is probably in poor taste in retrospect, probably shouldn't have done it when it happened. Um, <laughs> once uh, once uh, the uh, Notre Dame was, was uh, you know, on fire, I was like, I'm looking forward to hearing Trump's 20 minute soliloquy about how hunchbacks are bad or something like that. Right. So kind of like making fun of him again, poor taste, probably shouldn't have done that, might delete it. Uh, but I but I, I was reading your book and I was like, oh, I might, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if it's a good idea for me to sort of exempt people yeah. from contempt. Be like, ah, oh, it's fine if I'm contemptful of that guy. I don't yeah. know. Do you, do no, you have they, people that are, are within your radar that you're uh, OK for them, but no, not for anybody else? Th- nobody. And, and the reason is because there are ideas that are worthy of contempt, but there are no people that okay. are worthy of contempt. And the other thing is that we're paying too much attention to celebrities in this country. And so we're too we're too manipulated by people who have the mic microphone. And so one of the things that I recommend is that people pay less attention. If they're, if they're really freaked out by the president of the United States, there are two things that I recommend. And I was giving a talk at a university, which I do most days these days. And, and a lady said, look, I, I get it. I get it. But I have contempt. It's exactly what she said. I have contempt for President Trump. She's a very liberal lady. I have contempt for President Trump. What should I do? Give me advice, doctor. And I said, I, I advise two things. Turn off the news. You don't have to watch it 15 hours a day. I mean, read the, read the newspaper for 10 minutes in the morning, but you don't need to be constantly updated. You don't need to know what, what Donald Trump is writing on his Twitter feed. You don't need to know that. That's nothing more than, that's prurient. Mm-hmm. That's, just, that's just a reality show. Number two is if you really want to feel more love in your heart and less contempt, then what I recommend is that you, you make some friends who love President Trump and who trust President Trump and who admire President Trump. And you say, and you, say, and you, be, you lay it on the line. And to be honest, don't say, here's all the way that he lied say I couldn't sleep last night something was really bothering me and I need you to help me I need you to help me understand why you love him 
Mm. What is so great about him? What am I missing? And, and with honesty and openness, actually listen to those people. And you'll come to love those people because they love their families and they love their kids and they love their country, just like you They're love not those things. at home sharpening pitchforks. Yeah. They've, they've actually got some good positive qualities. And you're going to disagree. You're going to disagree on, on, on the way that our society should be sh- set up. And you're, and you're going to think that they have not progressive attitudes on certain things, for sure. If you don't like President Trump, you're a liberal. People who are listening to us, there are some, a bunch. And they're going to say, yeah, yeah, I disagree with, you know, how a lot of these Trump supporters, how they view race relations in this country. But but that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to disagree on things such that we can make progress without killing each other and listen to them and listen to them with love and 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 get together with people that you really do love who admire President Trump. And it, it will rock your world. Turn off the principle and listen to the citizens a little bit. And, and it, it just makes life better. All of that makes so you're telling me I shouldn't silo myself with just people that I feel comfortable with and will will agree with my opinions. Yeah, because you just get madder and madder and madder and madder. And again, when you actually feel not just when you express contempt, but when you feel contempt, that will that will raise your level of anxiety, loneliness, depression, and and stress. And you don't need that. We all deserve to have have more love in our lives. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems with social media is it's an accelerant to all the big things that are going. All these all these metastatically terrible trends that are happening, a polarization and tribalism in our country, and. The, the point is that the way that social media learns, it's it's an artificial intelligence. It's a bot. It's a it's a bot that's actually making your life worse. So you get on social media, you get on Twitter or, or Facebook, particularly on Facebook, and it learns what you read and it feeds you more of that. It, it, it's the same thing, by the way. If you go on the on the on the app for the newspaper you like to read, and you read a you read an op ed that says Trump is stupid. The next one it'll give you is Trump is evil. And the mm. one after that is that Trump's followers are evil and that America is deviant. And it'll just pretty soon you're, you're, you're out of your mind. It's because AI is figuring out a way to work your dopamine circuits. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's a hormone in your brain that it's a reward. And something that outrages you a little more, just like getting another cigarette, gives you a Which little... Which is addictive. Tiny, it's it's a, very outrage it's, is addictive. And self-righteousness. They're both very oh, addictive yeah. emotions. Oh, yeah. Virtue signaling, mm-hmm. all of this stuff. It, 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 it will addict you. But, but you don't like in the same way that nobody says, you know what I really love? I love cigarette companies because they give me this thing that I like. It's everybody's like, I want to quit. You know, it's the same way that people feel who are chronic users of social media. You know, I'll see guys that and I live in D.C., you know, kind of so you don't have to, Andrew. And, Thank you. And, Thank and, you, you know, very much, it's Arthur. My, it's, like, it's like I just give and give. And, you know, I'll see guys, at, you know, looking at Twitter at the urinal and like this is a cry for help. Yeah, I, you know, something that I do, um, I've, and weirdly, a, a lot of my comedian friends, because uh, my, my background's comedy, I was living in, in New York doing comedy the last few years, uh, a lot of my comedian friends, the first thing they would, they, they'll do when they wake up in the morning is they'll jump on Twitter. And I'm like, I can't, I, I make it, I never check my email until I've been awake for at least half an hour, usually an so hour. So you've had two drinks. Yes, exactly. I, I'm not, I, I need to have two martinis before, <laughs> I, before I'm willing to. So that's to, like a whole half hour after yeah, you wake exactly. up, right? But no, but I, but I want, like, I, it's important to me that, um, uh, like we we were talking about this earlier, like I think equanimity is a good thing. I like like in, in Buddhism, your your friend the Dalai Lama would know way better than me. I'm assuming you know better than me, but it, it seems to me that the Buddhist ideal is you you want to be compassionate, but you want to you want to be placid. You 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 want to be compassionate, but you don't want to outsource uh, uh, moral torpitude to other people. You don't want to give other people the ability to ruffle you. And I think that's very good. So uh, when I wake up in the morning, I is a point I don't. I don't want to have communication with the outside world because I want to kind of set the tone of the day and I right. want to be captain of the ship rather than emotionally and energetically giving everybody else the uh, being at the beck and call of the rest of the world. Absolutely. Look, I mean, you, you can be the master of your feelings or the slave to your feelings. I mean, you choose that the people who are most in control, who have the most peace in their lives, the equanimity that we're talking about is peace. If you are the master of your own feelings, if you can, if you can own yourself, look, this is what it's all about, in my view, to be an American. You know, the, one of the great uh, ideas that we've had in this country is that, that you can be, you are the CEO of Andrew Heaton, Inc. Mm. And part of doing that is 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 managing yourself. You know, I've been, I've been the CEO of a company for the past 10 years. I've been president of the American Enterprise Institute. And before I came to AEI, I was an academic and I had never run anything. I'd never had one employee. I'd never raised $1. Now my job is I, I supervise 280 employees. I raise $50 million a year with my colleagues. and I do 175 speeches a year. It's a very different life. Wow. And people often ask, what's the biggest thing you've learned over the past 10 years? And the answer is very simple, how to manage me to be the CEO to me. That's the most important thing. So, and, and every, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be the president of the big think tank in Washington, 
Washington, D.C. You can just be dad or, you know, an insurance adjuster or, you know, somebody who's working as a temp. You still have to be the CEO of you. And the most important way to do that is to be the master of your feelings. The day that you let some Russian bot or some, you know, some person on Twitter who's trying to fire you up or somebody, God forbid, is making money and getting powerful, just getting satisfaction and jollies from your anger, that is a person who's taken away your ability to be a good CEO. You've become a worse leader to yourself. So here, this is another thing, that, and I'm just going to be self-indulgent here. This isn't yeah. even for the benefit of the audience. This is just for my benefit. <laughs> I'm not worried about, um, I, I feel like I'm on the lookout and have been for a long time for anger and fear from uh, media and political leaders. And I'm pretty good at being able to show that off. But let's say that the, the goal of the person online, or even in my life, isn't to get me angry, it's to hurt me. Because uh, I find that to be uh, a frequent occurrence in my my zone in the universe. I'm, I'm a political orphan. I don't really have a team. Right. I'm not on red team. I'm not on blue team. Uh, and there are a lot of people that are deeply invested in that dichotomy that right. do not like it and mm-hmm. will, rather than responding with, you know, I think the, the most accurate assessment of I wish you were more of a team player will go, well, I think you're a bigot or right. I think you're evil or I think you're because you're because I'm friends with everybody, then I must be you know platforming bigots or something like right. that, and it's it's deeply hurtful. It's, Does it it's, hurt you? Yeah, I I, w- I wish. Um, uh, so not not to get into his politics now, but I interviewed Tucker Carlson years mm-hmm. ago, back before he was a Fox guy. Right, he's um, a mutual friend. Yeah, he yeah. Uh, he he was it was I think he was just running. Um, uh, he was run, he was running the the, the the was it the DC not not the Examiner you know, you know the, the Daily Beast the Daily um, I mean, sorry the Daily Daily Caller Daily Caller he, yeah, he, Daily all Caller. he was doing was that at the time he's a terrific entrepreneur uh, and yeah. uh, and I I was I was I was really early in my career and I was trying to get him like he just done Dancing with the Stars and I was trying to get him I was trying to do like a joke and it, it didn't work out afterwards we finished up this interview uh, the the mics were off and I went can I ask you something and I don't mean I don't mean this in an offensive way but tons of people hate you like how do you deal with that. Uh, like I'm going into political comedy, I assume that's going to happen. And he went, I only, I don't care. I only care what my friends, my family, and my coworkers think. And if you let anybody else bother you, it's going to ruin you. And I, I wish I could internalize that, but I have a difficult time doing it. It's difficult for me to um, uh, to engage with somebody and then be and them going, well, I hate you, and me go, oh, okay, that's fine. That kind of intestinal fortitude depends on the person. I mean, there are certain people who can do that naturally better than other people, right? And and there's some certain people. Is who there are, like a supplement I can well, get? Can I like do I, do I need people, iron? Well, part of it is that you need reps, and you're getting them. Ah. Look, since November, you've had a national platform, okay. and you've got thousands of people that are listening to your podcast, mm-hmm. and 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 the and the audience is growing, and so getting the reps is very important. It's like it's a building up the the strength of your muscles. You know, it it actually kind of hurts and is uncomfortable when you get into the gym for the first time. Okay, but you have to treat it like a, the same way that you would expose yourself to a, to a pathogen such that you are no longer allergic to it. So, so pathogens can break you down, but you have to treat yourself in the right way. So in other words, you expose yourself systematically to these things saying, this is actually important to make me stronger. And, and, and people can do that. So if you're naturally a sensitive person, which you, you are, that's a good thing. That's a virtue, by the way. That's not a weakness. <laughs> then what you need is actually to systematically expose yourself to the pathogen in a way where you're saying, I am doing this to become stronger. Now, one of the ways that I would recommend As opposed to, do to just this, folding and going home and going, why doesn't anybody you know, like me? Like I'm me. alone I again. I, know. I should get a dog. I know. And, you know, in, in, in you know, Washington, D.C., you get you super wiped out fast because, you know, everybody basically wants you to fail, even people who are really friendly to you, because there's so much, you know, professional envy that's going on. It's like this, like this cauldron of deadly sins that are happening all the time. You, 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 you live in a town that's entirely populated by former student council presidents, oh, and awful. that has an interesting oh, psychological I know, I know, effect. I, know. To I it. mean, it's, a, and it's, and it's, it's excellent, and people are really smart, and there's a lot of ideas going around, there's a lot of good things about it, too. One of my great friends at, uh, one of my colleagues at AEI, when I first got there, he said, you know, you got to know, you got to know who your friends are. And I said, how do I know? He says, they're the ones who stab you in the chest. <laughs> huh. And so, so the, the truth is, if you're going to be in the idea space, you have to actually get the reps to build up that fortitude. The second thing to keep in mind is what a privilege it is that somebody's saying that Andrew Heaton is a moron. What a privilege it is. Because you know why they're saying that? Because you're dishing it out. And so what a privilege it is to have to take it. Because you know the worst thing that could possibly happen? No one crickets. Would that crickets, be the, yeah, crickets would be a the worst thing. A tumbleweed yeah. going yeah. through your Twitter feed. Yeah. I mean, that's the worst. It's like Andrew, who? And and you want to actually have an impact on the debate, and you are. And no matter what, you're going to expose yourself to contempt. And then the third thing, so no, it's reps, gratitude, 
And the last thing to keep in mind is the opportunity that comes. So when, when people actually treat you with contempt, never when somebody's anonymous must you ever interact with an anonymous entity because love only goes between people. Hmm. It doesn't go between um, um, Andrew Heaton and a Russian Twitter bot. That's, gotcha. an, that's an asymmetric that's helpful. relationship. So don't, yeah. don't, don't put a lot of energy into, yeah. into Twitter And all our science fiction fans are going, no, no, you can love a cyborg. Right? Anyway, so. <laughs> that's the one thing I'll get feedback I on. This episode. Episode I really enjoyed your episode with Arthur Brooks. You made some great points, but he mentioned something, you know what, Data, Data had a girlfriend. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. So, 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 so don't interact with anonymous, you know, people, or people or non-people, but people who who do treat you with contempt. That's your opportunity because you get to. And this gets back to the what the the Buddhists say: the stimulus and response actually is the measure of the master. So when you're stimulated with contempt and you answer with contempt, you've shown that you're not the master. But if you extend if you extend the space between stimulus and response, you stop. You don't react. And then you choose your response. Then, then you actually exhibit the, the characteristics of the Lord Buddha. That makes you the master. And okay. that's what you want, ultimately. So, so remember these three things. Reps, gratitude, response. And that's the way that when you feel exposed and you feel hurt, that you can turn it toward your advantage and become a better person and, and help all the rest of us that much more, too. Uh, thank you for that. That's, oh man, I, I, I'm thrilled that uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful piece of advice. Thank you. I, is, is, is this been your experience? Cause yeah. you're, you're, um, I like you, you seem like a great guy. I don't know you super well, yeah. but, um, but I'm also, uh, I probably in a friendly, receptive audience to you. I know that you're, you're doing a lot of university speeches and things like that, but you're also the head of AEI, which right. is a conservative think tank. Um, did you have to develop a thick skin? Do you find that people are generally receptive? Do you find they bristle when they meet you? What are your experiences? Uh, you know, it's, it turns out when, you know, my beat is love and reconciliation that people don't really pick at me that much. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, let's go pick it and shut down the love guy. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's, not, you know, that's a pretty self-defeating strategy for yeah. activists, right? So, so I don't get that much pushback. There are people who disagree. There are people who think I'm cynical, people who think I'm full of it. There are people who think I'm weak. You know, and so, so I do get a little bit of that. Um, and when I first came to AEI, look, I'm, 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 I'm conservative in my politics. I'm, I'm center right in most of the things that I think. I try to have a varied point of view, and I try not just to be persuasive, but to also be persuadable, because there's a deep satisfaction that comes from being persuaded by other people. You, you, you also very much strike me as a thinker, and not a not a reflexive doctrinaire individual. I'm not an activist. I'm just not an activist. And I got mm. nothing against activists, but activists have to be surer of their positions than they actually are. Mm. They have to act surer of their position. Because, you know, a little bit of weakness, you know, you go to a, you show up at a rally and you've got a sign. With a question say, mark you know, on it? And so question mark. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm still st still working this one out. Minimum I mean, wage, just, maybe, question mark? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Question mark? Yeah. Like, can't we discuss? You know, that, that, that's not, you know, good activism. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. Turns out. So, but, but I'm not, I'm not an activist. You know, I'm actually looking for a competition of ideas I'm, I'm look and, and and my views are, are based on I think human welfare you know I'm based on the idea that there's a radical equality of human dignity and a limitlessness of human potential the reason I love free enterprise is not because I, I think capitalism is dandy per se I think it's a machine like any other machine like my car I think my car is great because I use it to get to work but I could use it for great evil mm -hmm. I try to base my ideas in basic morality and listen to other people and and that's a it's, it's so satisfying it's so fun I have to find but and, and the result of it is I, you know there are people who disagree with me or say I'm a chump or a moron, but it's not very frequent. Mostly people treat me really, really well. Um, and if they don't, that's okay too. I'm, I'm leaving AEI. I'm retiring as president of AEI on June 30th, 2019. Do they know? They it do. Should, okay, I just <laughs> so okay. I'm announcing that right now, just right. like you're announcing your presidential Yes, run. exactly, yes. And, uh, I'm going to be the 800th Democrat. Also, I'm a Democrat now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm going to teach at Harvard University uh, starting July 1st. Congrats. I've heard very good things about them. It's a, it's a, it's a fine university. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, I've heard of it, too. It's an older one, too. It's an older yeah. one. <laughs> it's a, my family immigrated to the United States in 1630, which was eight years before the founding of Harvard University. Nice. You got seniority. I know. I know. <clears throat> what are you going to be teaching there? <laughs> leadership. Okay. So I'm at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'll be teaching courses in conflict and collaboration and leadership and how to lead a social enterprise. Basically, how to manage yourself. And in the Harvard Business School in the spring, because I have a joint appointment between the Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School, I'll be teaching a class on happiness and leadership. And what a privilege it is. It, and it, will there be resistance to you know a guy who has run a conservative think tank? For sure. I hope so. I hope we can have a big competition of ideas. But, you know, what I love is that Harvard University asked me to come because I think differently than than. Well, like I meant, I have a background. As I mean, a I'm scholar, sure they, they I'm sure they Googled you. They, they must yeah, they, they must have watched some of my yeah, clips. Yeah. And, you know, then and they, they said, let's have somebody who thinks differently because we believe in a competition of ideas. And I really, really admire that. And and I'm looking forward to the resistance.
are you, are you to are the you, extent that it's that's you know there and are, are you bullish in general on uh, on reconciliation like do you do you I, we had a guest on um, a couple of months ago who um, was great. I, he, he blew my mind. His name's Morris Fiorina. He's out yeah, of the Hoover Institute. Sure. Uh, and he, he, uh, he had many of the sentiments that are in your book that basically um, the way he says it is we're not actually more politically divided. We're just better sorted. Uh, but, but that there is this sort of um, nonpartisan consensus uh, for a vast portion of the country where most people think you should have guns, but you shouldn't be allowed to own a rocket launcher. You right. know, you, you know, uh, hate speech is bad, but identity politics is not the way to respond to it. There's actually a great deal of consensus, which I, I was really, really bolstered by, uh, because I think that in the in the ideas world, the, the political class, and the media class do tend to be ideologues and tend to be right. very, very highly sorted. Uh, but when you get outside of that, it's not the case. People are not very Manichaean. Yeah. Most Americans are not black and white. They they basically see some shades of gray. And they, they see it in the way that they, their parents to their kids and the way that they manage their friendships. You know, they say, look, I disagree with my friend over there, but man, he's awesome and I yeah. love him. And you know, 100% of the people listening to us um, and watching us, they have, who are, who are paying customers to the blaze, which they should be. And, and who are listening to your podcast, which they should, um, they every 100 percent love somebody with whom they disagree politically. I think you're absolutely right. And like in this this audience in particular, I mean, yeah. like you, you mentioned the exhausted majority in the book. Yeah. And, and I, I do think that is a thing. There's a there's a lot of us that are like we're showing up going. I just wanted to get brisket. I did not know that I was going to be in a screaming match between these two groups of people. Right. Like I, I didn't come here for the yelling. And I, I think there's a, a lot of people like that. Yeah. that but it, it's not a good angle it, it, from a media perspective. It's difficult to go. Hey, a lot of the country was quiet today. Yeah. That's, no, I know. It's like a, guess that. what? You know, nobody did anything outrageous today. And and what you're not saying, however, I think it's important for us to emphasize is you're not saying that we shouldn't disagree because disagreement, once again, is the source of excellence. Hold your views and hold them well. Be persuasive as you possibly can be. Be persuadable because humility requires it. But but hold your views and, you know, stand up, stand up for what you think. But don't do it in a way where you're not going to persuade anybody by saying that somebody else is an idiot and where people watching won't be persuaded by you. I mean, these are basic techniques of being a civilized person. But you're also not suggesting that we just be civil to each other, that, you know, what, what America needs is one where we can, you know, if I said, hey, Andrew, my wife Esther and I were civil to each other. You'd be like, golly, you guys need counseling. <laughs> and so, you know, we're not talking about any of this stuff. It's like, mix it up. A screaming match is actually okay between friends who love each other. It's, it's actually, all of this stuff is really, really good. The problem is that we're being told to hold other people in disdain, that we're being told that people who disagree with us are deviant. That's a problem that the political class is feeding us. It's a it's it's claptrap, actually. Mm. It's what a big part of media is giving us these days, and what even a big part of academia is giving us these days. And and we need to we need those of us who are in the ninety three percent plus that think America is too divided today. We need to fight back, not by agreeing, because disagreement is stagnation and mediocrity. I mean, agreement is a problem. Disagreement is good. It's I, I feel like you're goading me into disagreeing with you on this one. It's some kind of mental cone. <laughs> well, and, but, but all kinds of disagreement are, are really good. And, and it doesn't mean we have to disagree for the sake of disagreeing, but, but we should be able to do that. But at the same time, that is, we need not to disagree less. We need to disagree better. Yeah. And disagreement can actually, paradoxically, bring people together. One, one, of the, one of the things that I frequently point out in this program is that there's a, a world of difference between believing someone is an error versus believing they're in sin. If, yeah. if you're, if mm. I, I can, I can, I have no problem with someone going, I think you're dead wrong about, you know, uh, I, I think the minimum wage is a bad idea. I could be wrong about it, but I think it's a bad idea. I don't mind anybody going, you're, you're wrong on that. Let me, uh, actually one of my friends, I've, I have a really good conversation with him. Uh, when I'm up in New York, he writes for last week tonight. He's more of a, um, he, I mean, he's clearly a Democrat, but we have right. really good conversations. We respect each other. Right. Uh, and I, and we, there's never been a question of the intentionality behind us, but that's a very different conversation of us comparing notes on, on employment rates involving minimum wage than, uh, I think you hate poor people. Yeah. Uh, and like clearly I, Andrew Heaton, must own a factory or something. And yeah, I'm, no, I'm that's, pushing... and that's ad hominem. And then this is one of the weakest forms of argumentation is where you go immediately to the motivations of the person with whom you're arguing and say, look, Andrew, I, I know it's really on your heart. Well, no, I don't. I mean, the, turn is, the, tr the truth is we don't know anything about each other in America today. I, I, note, I note in the book this uh, very interesting article from the Journal of Politics that, that, that from, based on a new survey that shows that 40% of Democrats think think that no that that the, the average democrat thinks that 40% of republicans make $250,000 a year or more well we in that case we could raise taxes <laughs> couldn't we <laughs> or we point, wouldn't need it's to it's 2.2% yeah. and and 40% or the average democrat uh, republican thinks that 40% of democrats are lgbt and okay. which 
it's six percent. So yeah. you know, we don't if we don't even know those basic demographic facts about each other, how are we going to know what our motivations are? It's also a very weak form of argumentation. Mm -hmm. So so when you basically stay to the facts and talk and think about what you're actually arguing about, look, you and I were when we were, before we went on the air, we were talking about religion. Yeah, and you and, and I have Buddhism different and views on religion and Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like you know, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm in my Christian faith is the absolute center of my life. It's not for you. I don't think you know Andrew Heaton is some sort of weird deviant. I just think that you see it differently than I do. And and if and if, if you know, the best case, I can maybe make something that's sort of persuasive and make it winsome and make it attractive. So Andrew's like, I met Arthur Brooks, I had him on my show, and he's a big Christian, and 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 you know he's got something going there. And and maybe that because that's going to attract you a lot more than saying you know you better repent, you moron. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I like I, I think um, you know uh, pluralism is a good thing. I, I don't have a problem with with different worldviews competing, and uh, and I'm kind of like I had a. Um, uh, last year I was in New York and I was on a, a subway and a guy uh, a guy did like one of those dances on the subway where he's like jumping around pulls and things and this um like fifty year old guy in a trench coat just stood up and was like okay and he started doing it too like afterwards and it was it was hilarious it was really funny and like and I was watching him and these <laughs> these people interact they were clearly tourists and I was like where like you guys are great where are you from and they're like we're Jehovah's Witnesses we're from France and I was like guess I like you guys now like I kind of yeah. kind of thought you all were weird but that was a pretty good pole dance well they so, are weird. But that's okay. Yeah. You did something that actually gave you some satisfaction, that gave you a little bit of joy. And you'll look, let's do that for each other, man. I mean, let's do that for each other. There's a reason that people are tuning into you because you're funny and because they're learning something. And it's because it's worth the hour of their time. Hmm. That's Thank a, you. It's a great thing. And on that note, complimenting me, we'll go ahead and conclude. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? To any, any projects you'd like to point people to? Yeah, I want people to go. So we, we're dropping this movie, The Pursuit, which is a, a, it's really the kind of capstone of my career <laughs> at this point um, to talk I'd, about. I, I don't think it'll be the final one, given that you've no. gone from French horn, professional French hornist to think tank uh, academician, think, think, think tanker, think tankist, yeah. <laughs> to head of the think tank, to author, to professor. I, I assume that like in another 10 years, you're going to be an acrobat, but you'll also be governor. They'll, they'll be, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, be the, I'll be the juggling governor, the guy who's yeah. you know, juggling torches all yeah, the yeah. way to the governor's mansion or something. So, you know, God only knows what's in store for me, but this, this film, um, it, it encapsulates all the things that I, th I think I've, that I, that I really care about. And, and it's, it does so in a, in a very beautiful way because the filmmaker is extremely talented. So if the people are listening to us, go to thepursuitmovie.com, which is the website where you can see the trailer and you can see where the showings are happening. They're screening all over the country right now. Um, it's going to some international film festivals and it'll be on digital platforms starting this summer. And, you know, it's a watch the movie, have some popcorn. If you like it, show it to a friend Take a friend who disagrees with you to this movie. That's what I would really like people to do. And then, the, then the book is is love your enemies. And and if I if people read it and they have a revolution of the heart and they love their enemies a little bit more, maybe even realize they weren't enemies after all. It'll it'll it, it you know, that's why I wrote it. I I think you will find this audience to be very receptive to to both ideas that uh, loving people you disagree with is good, and so are markets. I think you're I think you're at the the ground zero of those two the, ideas. The Andrew Hayden show is the sweet spot. It is of yeah. those two things. Markets are good, and so is love. That could be the secondary motto. Uh, Arthur Brooks, thank you so much for coming on. I had a great time talking to you. Thank you for carving out time. Thank you for your beautiful show, and thanks to the whole audience for staying through all the way to the end. Hey, what say you and I hit up some listener feedback before we toddle off to the rest of our day? Dark Icky Rose, which I think is a pretty well-established family in Kenny Bunkport, says on iTunes, It was kind of a pain to download iTunes and get my old Apple ID unlocked, but it's worth it to review this underappreciated show. Andrew Heaton is hilarious, and I've been a fan for years. The skits he writes for his totally real sponsors are, are a highlight of every episode. And he has on a diverse set of guests with whom he always has civil discussions, whether he's talking about sci-fi, politics, the latest weird news, or some combination of the three. Plus, he emailed me back within half an hour, which means that he clearly is not receiving enough fan mail. Get on that, people. Oh, that's very kind of you, and I am so happy that my assistants were able to affect my voice in responding to the email you apparently sent me. Thank you. You can watch this whole show, uh, whole show on YouTube if you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. You can see my handsome bearded face and an assortment of suits and the dead bison that we screwed to the wall. Arthur Brooks also looked fan fantastic today. We both look very, very well suited, and I, I think we both probably have uh, bespoke suits, too, so you could check that out. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your office computer or on the phone of the guy next to you in traffic at a stoplight will only make you seem more sophisticated 
excuse me, will make you seem more sophisticated and amusing. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. I look like the soul patch and the elbow patch had a love child. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heat. That was good. Jennings, that was a great one. Soul patch and a love patch had a, a love child. That was some good wordplay. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at Facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out on Fridays. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. Thank you and good day.